started. That would be very nice. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for joining us this morning. We're going to have a presentation as part of our Thought Leader series. And our Thought Leader series this year has focused on the theme of DEI. And we've had uh, several talks already in this area, and we have another special talk today where, of course, we scour the world and try to find the greatest thought leaders that have really intriguing and provocative ideas to share with us and help us see the future and the horizon in a, uh, in a different way. I am not going to do the introduction of the thought leader today. I'm not even going to tell you his name uh, because I'm going to leave all of that pleasure and privilege to God, our provost, who uh, I will introduce in a second. But I do want to say that back in the 60s, there was a fellow named uh, Gordon Moore. And Gordon Moore came up with what's known as Moore's Law. And some of you in technology may know Moore's Law. And Moore's Law said, this is 1965, uh, said that every two years, the number of transistors on a chip is going to double. And the computing power of chips is going to double every two years. And that's really helped true to today. So today, I am going to present Grasso's Law. And Grasso's law is that anyone who has done anything important in higher education has passed through the University of Michigan. And with that, I will leave it at that, and I will now turn it over to our very distinguished provost, Gabriela Scarlatta. everybody for being here today. I so appreciate you being here and I want to thank our faculty who brought students. Thank you for being here. I hope you enjoy this talk. Uh, I'm very excited to welcome and introduce Dr. Desmond Patton to the University of Michigan Dearborn. When we were looking uh, for possible speakers to visit our campus, Dr. Patton's profile seemed to fit best our current priorities and concerns, especially when it comes to student success DE&I, community engagement, and mental health. Dr. Patton studies the impact social media has on well-being, mental health, trauma, violence, and grief for youth and adults of color, something that unfortunately we hear every day. He leverages social work thinking, data science, qualitative methods, and community partnerships to develop strategies to support digital grief and trauma and reduce on and offline gun-related violence. Desmond is the Brian and Randy Schwartz University Professor and the 31st Penn Integrates Knowledge University Professor. He has joint appointments in the School of Social Policy and Practice and the Annenberg School for Communication, along with a secondary appointment in the Department of Psychiatry in the Perelman School of Medicine. He has also won numerous awards, including the 2018 Deborah K. Paget Early Career Achievement Award from the Society for Social Work Research at Harvard. Previously, he was Professor of Social Work and Sociology at Columbia <coughs> University, Senior Associate Dean at Columbia School of Social Work and Associate Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Data Science Institute at Columbia. But most importantly, and getting to what Chancellor Grass said, Dr. Patton has a Michigan connection. Okay. He did his MSW at UM Ann Arbor's um, and served as an assistant professor in the School of Social Work from 2012 to 2015. His groundbreaking research into the relationship between social media and gang violence has led to his becoming the most cited and recognized scholar in this increasingly important area of social science. 
In 2018, Professor Patton published a groundbreaking finding in the prestigious Nature Journal Digital Medicine, which uncovered grief as a pathway to aggressive communication on Twitter. Twitter. <laughs> the report was cited in an Amici Courier brief submitted to the United States Supreme Court in Ilonis versus United States, which examined the interpretation of threats on social media. Widely referenced across disciplines, Patton's research has been mentioned in the New York Times, Nature, the Washington Post, NPR, Vice News, ABC News, and other prestigious media outlets. I could go on and on talking about Professor Patton's accomplishments, but I will instead invite him to the podium to share his talk today, titled, How Technology Developers and Social Scientists Can Work Together to Combat Bias in the Metaverse. Thanks for accepting our invitation, Dr. Patton. We are very, very happy for you to be here. Please help me welcome Dr. Patton. Good morning. It is so great to be back in the state of Michigan. I already feel better about life and forever and always go blue. I want to say good morning and special thanks to Chancellor uh, Grasso and Provost uh, Scarlato and the Provost's office for this invitation to return to Michigan to share my thoughts around how social scientists and technologists can work together to tackle bias in our broader digital world, and the developing metaverse. I'm no stranger to this specific collaboration. For the last decade, I have partnered with computer and data scientists, engineers, social workers, psychiatrists, and community members to better understand the impact that social media has on gun and gang violence, trauma, loss, and grief. And so today, I want to describe why we need social scientists and technologists to be talking to each other, to be working together to tackle this bias in technological systems. And I'm going to share a little bit about my own struggles and learnings and strategies for tackling bias in my own work, and end with some concrete ideas for how we might tackle bias in the developing metaverse. So I define myself as a social worker, a social scientist, and a public interest technologist. I trained in social work just down the street at U of M in the School of Social Work, which taught me the importance of reflexivity, active listening, and approaches for centering marginalized voices. I got my PhD in social welfare policy and injury science at the University of Chicago, where I honed qualitative skills and methodologies and community-based participatory research practices. My interest in technology and data science, however, stemmed from deep conversations with young people. Young people in Chicago, in Detroit, in New York City, who opened my eyes to the importance of social media and specifically how youth use social media to navigate the world around them. And so for a decade, I have understood and studied social media as a neighborhood as an environmental context with youth spend an enormous amount of time building community, exchanging ideas, developing and running social movements, and on the other end, engaged in and exposed to trauma, harm, grief, violence that can be expressed in text, in videos, and images, and live stream, and the like. But critical to this journey has been an intentional transdisciplinary approach and integration of ideas, and theories and methods in order to define and analyze and widely disseminate these findings and challenges surrounding this new area of study of social media and gun violence. So here's where I sit. We need social scientists to work with technologists because there are persistent social problems that now exist in both the physical and digital worlds. And it's important to understand that these worlds are now blending together. Broader social science scholarship provides history and context and nuance and correlative and causal inferences that afford us a deeper understanding and analysis of social conditions. But when those conditions move online, we need innovative approaches to studying data that now show us text on social media and images and video and emoji and the like. 
And so I think in order to have a conversation about collaboration between social scientists and technologists, we must first start with ourselves. If you're gonna have a, a truly reflexive and reflective conversation about the biases that we bring to these systems. And so our belief systems, our attitudes, our cultural references, these all matter. The scripts that we tell ourselves, that we've gotten from our communities and our families, all matter for how we build true and authentic and organic relationships between technologists and social scientists. And I want to start with where I started, with these two men, these two young boys. This is Chief Keith and little Jojo, both from the south side of Chicago, just blocks from where I was studying at the University of Chicago. In 2012, I learned about a beef they were having on Twitter. They're from rival crews, one gangster disciple, one black disciple. And like young boys, they were puffing their chest on wine, talking junk to each other, taunting each other back and forth. Little Jojo got tired of the back and forth and said, you want to do something about it? Meet me on this block in this exact location. He posted that on Twitter. And within three hours, he was murdered in that exact location. And so I read the story and was fascinated. But at the same time, I was wrestling with my own imbibing of white toxic supremacist ideas about these images that you see here. And so instead of seeing these young boys as in their fullness, seeing them as community members and as young people, I, I quickly criminalized them and wanted to figure out how can I study their Twitter life to predict violence. Now, the intent was to reduce violence. The intent was one of hope. But it was not one that understood the humanity of these young boys. It fueled the questions that I asked. It fueled how I analyzed data. It fueled the trajectory of a research career and who I train and how I train them. So again, that starting place with the information that I'm imbibing as a researcher and how I'm connected to the research matters for the types of collaborations that I set up with technologists. And so I could be transformational or I can be replicating harm. So for me, these two young men, these two boys, is where it starts. So I'm going to take you on a journey. I have studied violence in Chicago. This is 2012. I've learned about Chief Keefe and Little Jojo. Now I'm a first year assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Social Work, looking for that next big study. And I remembered what I had learned. I remember what I had heard from young boys and girls in Chicago about their life on Twitter and about what was happening. This kind of navigation of Twitter is not just a communication space, but as a neighborhood, as an ecological environment, and a place where young people were mapping safety in terms of identifying safe and unsafe locations in the neighborhood. And so the Chief Keith and Little Jojo narrative fueled this curiosity into this new phenomenon. And so I wanted to dig into this. I went to the literature to kind of figure out, well, what's already there? And there was almost no literature on this topic. And so with my classmates, from the University of Chicago, we wrote the first paper to define this idea of internet banking, which is essentially a play on words for gang banking. But what I think this initial idea does is that it chiefly is it's chiefly focused on the unintended uses of technical systems. Or in other words, what happens when engineers don't talk to social scientists? And in this article, we conceptualize the idea that some young people who may self-identify as gang involved may use social media to taunt, bully, or instigate beefs and other forms of violence throughout text and images on social media. But then we also go a step further, really digging into those social science sensibilities and asking what conditions shape aggressive language online? How might one's intersectional self who you are as a person, how you view your masculinity, your community, your neighborhood, how you see yourself in the world, how does that shape how you behave and engage online? And so this is where it started for me. But we can apply these same types of questions, these same logics, if you will, 
to, to a case that happened just down the block from you. I want to introduce you to Robert Williams He's from Farmington Hills, Michigan, and worked in an automatic supply company. On a random Thursday afternoon, he received a call from the Detroit police telling him to come into the station to be arrested. An hour later, he was arrested at his home. The police wouldn't tell him why he was being arrested, but rather showed him a photo with the words, felony warrant larceny. Robert was taken to a detention center where he was booked and held overnight. The next day, he was taken to an interrogation room and questioned about the last time he was at a Shinola store. The police showed a still image from a surveillance video showing a heavyset man dressed in black and wearing a red St. Louis Cardinal cap standing in front of a watch display. The second piece of paper was a close-up, the photo blurry, but was not Mr. Williams. And so here, this particular case raises questions about the use of facial recognition systems in the broader policing system, and then begs the question about racism in policing. Why do we assume that Mr. Robert looks like any other black man who might be in a Shinola store? What are the logics and the questions that are not being asked that are used, that are, that are then used within these systems to then target an individual like Robert. And what's really challenging about cases like this is that it doesn't just affect Robert. You see, Robert's daughter was at home and was crying for her father, didn't understand what had happened. And how can you explain that, honey, the algorithm arrested dad? These are the types of questions that keep me up at night. These, these types of back and forths where there's clearly missed information, missed opportunity. Because there is a conversation that we need to have about safety. But we're not having a conversation about whether or not this particular tool is the tool to keep us all safe. So let's take a deeper dive in the use of facial recognition systems in the state of Michigan. Things like your driver's license and mugshots are used to compile state police and FBI databases. The FBI can use 35 million mugshots and driver's license that are available to them. What we know is that the Michigan police usually need probable cause for a mobile device, but only need law enforcement purpose for desktop searches. But what we're seeing is that there isn't a systematic approach to how these technological systems are deployed in communities. And I think more importantly, we're also not having a conversation about the types of processes that need to be embedded in approaches if and when we're going to use them. How do we know what we know? How do we know when we're getting it wrong? What questions need to be surfaced? And who is at the table when making these decisions? And so if we're going to have a conversation about social science and technology, it can't be a purely academic endeavor. It starts with self. It starts with reflexivity. It starts with having the difficult and complicated and nuanced conversations. And honestly, I have really enjoyed these types of conversations. I have spent the last 10 years hanging out with computer scientists and having these really complicated conversations. And what I've appreciated about the dynamic is that computer scientists and engineers aren't afraid of a hard problem. And so we can go at a problem and keep having these really rich discussions. But we have to bring in the context. We have to bring in history. It has to be contextualized. It has to be situated in community. So facial recognition systems is all about identifying and recognizing a person through mass data sets or through individual interactions like the face ID that you use to unlock your iPhone. With the same logics of prediction and assigning meaning for broad societal purpose can also be found in the healthcare system. Recent cardiovascular research has suggested that prediction rules for heart disease were biased. In this situation, care could be unequally distributed and inaccurate. In fact, researchers were surprised to find that folks who self-identified as black received lower risk scores. So how might a relationship between a social scientist and a technologist rectify the situation? 
what if we were having conversations about the scripts that shape how we conceptualize risk? How do we define risk? Who gets to define risk? What are the power narratives that are embedded in how we talk about risk? What narratives might be playing out that shape how data and conditions and disease are interpreted and coded? So there's always a place to go back to. As a qualitative person who works in tech, I spend a lot of time around the question of how we code and interpret textual and visual data. And the time that I spend on that, the rigor of the analysis that goes into that is critically important for how we then inform the types of AI systems that are built that can then go out and find and categorize and search and look for. These conversations, again, are critically important. So, another case, January 6th, Twitter labeled factual information about COVID-19 as misinformation. Facebook hosted surge of misinformation and insurrection threats in months leading to January 6th. So here, we have a couple of things happening. But one is that we have an unequal distribution of how surveillance happens. You, it will be easy for you to find examples and cases in which black and brown communities are hyper-surveilled for drug-related cases, so forth and so on. And yet, Americans have been planning and organizing and mobilizing around an insurrection that had been documented on Facebook for months, and yet these systems seemingly don't work now. Again, this idea of the need for who gets to decide what is what? What is misinformation? What happens when critically important data is mislabeled? So questions around validation, and who's participating in validation, and history, and context, and deep evaluation, this is where the rubber meets the road. These are the opportunities. These are the rich discussions. This is why we need collaboration between two groups. Ruha Benjamin has really helped me to understand the racial implications of when technological systems go awry, or when there's not a social scientist in the room. And so sociologist Dr. Ruha Benjamin defines what she has labeled the new gem code as a perpetuation of racial hierarchies through the means of technology and algorithms. She argues that the same biases or the things that we lack or missing context that exist outside of technology, why we need to connect with one another, are being implicitly coded into emerging software, thereby explicitly perpetuating racist behaviors. And so engaging in work with Ruha, this is why engineers need to be reading outside of engineering, need to be talking with folks like Ruha Benjamin, because it, it forces us to think about the, all the considerations of racial implications and hierarchies that may be missing from our design efforts, our building of systems. But also importantly, I also hear embedded in Ru what Ruha is teaching us is that we also need to have a conversation about inclusion. The lack of inclusion within and around artificial intelligence spaces and the development of this new idea of the metaverse may also explain how racism becomes baked into algorithmic code. Perpetuation of racial hierarchies through the means of technology and algorithms is where we need to be diving deeper. Biases that exist outside of technology are continuously being baked in. But let me say this clearly. I'm not talking about the type of inclusion that's about check boxes or meeting quotas. I'm talking about the kind of inclusion that's about true integration of thought, experiences, and ideas. It's the blending of truths and centering of folks on the margins. But we have to be intentional. So what does this mean for the metaverse? Do we even know what the metaverse is? Let's be honest. It's a term that you know is thrown, a lot of, thrown around a lot. And well, we know the tech industry loves a new, a good buzzword. And so everyone's talking about the metaverse, right? But broadly speaking, the metaverse is a virtual world where we can live and work and travel and play. But it doesn't actually exist yet. Uh, and it will take some time to build, but it hasn't stopped a plethora of businesses and organizations from getting involved. I think the most, the most prominent player in this space, of course, is Meta, Facebook. They've changed their name from Facebook to Meta. 
The big idea is that the metaverse is the next phase of the internet, and that this new digital world will be utopian, making our lives more connected and generally better. An economist suggests that the metaverse is going to make us a lot of money, eight to 13 trillion dollars by 2030. But, I know I've been joking around with this definition, but we can also think of the metaverse as a space that has always been with us. Our, smart, our smartphones, our laptops, virtual reality, augmented reality, AI systems and the like, these are things that we already have at play and we interact with as individuals and groups already. So for me, that means that we should be taking the pause because we already know that there's lots of issues with how AI is deployed across individuals and systems and groups. And so if we want to build a new thing, then hopefully this would insert a moment of pause to have those difficult and complicated conversations around who's at the table and what's missing and the potential spaces where racial hierarchies and misgendering and transphobia can all be at play if we are not careful. If we do not engage in thoughtful and deep conversations across schools, across research groups, to be thinking about, well, what is a metaverse where we all thrive? What is a metaverse that is healing and joyful and fun, as opposed to one that you might be scared to be a part of? Is that possible? Can we have hope in that space? I think we can. And you know, as a social worker, I think that we have some ideas. I think that there can be ways of thinking, approaches, ideas that are important. And so doubling down on my Michigan-trained social work education, I do think that there's a way in which we can approach how we collaborate, reflect, reflex, interrogate, and critique. One of the things I think we should always be thinking about when we begin collaborations is who should be making decisions about creation and usage of these new technological tools. We need to spend time brainstorming, thinking through, and anticipating how technolo te technological solutions operate and activate in diverse communities. We need to be having conversations outside of the communities that we sit in to make sure that these tools actually hold true for other people. Representation of individuals with diverse and complicated lived experiences should be a standard in how we begin the conversation around the metaverse and who develops the metaverse and what the metaverse should entail. And so I just want to make the plug. I think you should be talking to social workers. I think you should be talking to sociologists and humanists and nurses, and folks who are talking and connecting with people on the daily. There are a few points that I just want to make as it relates to the metaverse. If the metaverse uses existing bias data, engineers who don't have social and environmental context training may produce biased algorithms. So this also necessitates education. That if, we, if we're going to talk about 21st century higher learning, 21st century education, what does that look like as we imagine together new technological systems, new imaginaries. So we need to be having crossover education plans. We need to be having crossover courses where social scientists are taking classes with engineers and the like. And we're not trying to replace one another. We're sharing our knowledge base. We're sharing our expertise and figuring out a pathway forward together. I think we need to be documenting and developing and evolving and future planning ethical principles and community-centered approaches along the way as well. And that across the board, we need to be promoting regulation and core standards. And those core standards and policies and regulations need to be evidence-based. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about how this has applied in my own work. And this could be considered a cautionary tale because I have made lots of mistakes in my own thinking in terms of how I apply artificial intelligence and how I partner with computer scientists. I direct this thing called the Safe Lab. Uh, we are a research group that started at Michigan. And we are a hodgepodge of folks, social workers, computer scientists, engineers, computer vision folks, psychiatrists, sociologists, 
uh, nursing and youth and community members. And we have been working to translate and interpret social media data for the goal of creating algorithmic systems that can find psychosocial codes like aggression, substance abuse, and loss. But we've had a lot of moments where we've had to pause and think about how we are doing this work. Remember where I was talking about the intent of wanting to reduce violence? Well, there's been lots of times where we have missed meaning in social media data, missed understanding, trivialized things that are complex and more, that need more thought than we ever thought before. But this, the sweet spot of being in this lab space with engineers and nurses and social workers and community members is that we get to hold each other accountable and stay in community and push and have those really complex and hard conversations. One of the hardest and weirdest conversations I ever had was with my colleague, who is a very well-known computer scientist at Columbia. And she wrote to me in an email and was like, you know, the, our, our systems keep flagging the N-word as an aggressive term. I was like, okay, here we go. And so I, I, had, we, I said, this is not an email conversation. I think we should grab coffee because this is complex. And so I had to sit down and have a conversation with my white uh, colleague about the variations in how the N-word is used in the black community and that we shouldn't automatically consider it a negative term. And that, you, you would have thought that I like solved the hardest equation in the world because it wasn't something that she was considering. There was a lot of trust in the algorithmic system, but there also wasn't a lot of rigorous back and forth around how we might contextualize these errors that come up as well and what information do we not have to validate whether or not this algorithmic system is accurate or not. So while it was a weird conversation, it's one that I always remember because it also, was a com it also allowed us to build trust with one another. We could then have that complicated conversation. We could problematize together. We could work on hard problems together because she wasn't afraid to come to me and, and to have that conversation. And I wasn't afraid to tell her my truth and my viewpoints around that situation. So in the lab, we again, engage in interdisciplinary collaborations using natural language processing and computer vision with social work researchers. And our goal is to study the role of social media and gun violence. So this is where we start. We start with defining the problem. We then think about, well, where is the data that's going to help us understand that problem? Do we, are we creating data sets? Are we looking for data sets? And then my side of the house as a social worker, social scientists, and qualitative methodologists, we spend an enormous amount of time, probably more time than any computer scientist would, love, would like to hear, on annotating data. And so instead of having you know, traditional binary classifications, positive, negative, zero, one, yes or no, we wanted to engage in more of an anthropological dig into the data to see, well, how might we make meaning of this data? What are the biases that we're bringing into this interpretation and we're labeling these data and adding deep contextual interpretations and labels so that when we hand our data off to our computer science colleagues, it is a rich and rich with hand labeled data. This has been critically important because, as I said before, there's lots of misinterpretation that can be quite harmful. And so our strategy is that we use an inductive close read qualitative strategy to determine what social media expressions relate to expressions of loss and grief and aggression that may be following a shooting. At the time, I was primarily focused on the city of Chicago. But most importantly and critical to this process has been hiring and training annotators to carry out these tasks. And these annotators have been youth and have been social workers. So the collaboration, the difference in how we've approached this work has been situated in who we name as domain experts. These are young black and brown youth from Chicago and New York City who have been hired as research assistants in my lab. We pay them like we pay uh, graduate students. And they spend time helping us to translate and interpreting context is one of the things that we, we would readily, um, that we struggled with is that 
street names and institutions have different meaning depending on context, right? And so you can't just look at a street on the south side of Chicago and be like, that's just the street. Because that street could also be an invisible boundary between two rival crews or cliques. But we wouldn't know that unless we talk to folks. And so this talk, we start with this expertise. This is not participants. These are, not your, these are community members who live in these communities who have vested interest in their lives and the lives of other people. And so one of the things that I think is critically important if we're going to do this work is to recognize our lack of knowledge that maybe my PhD doesn't matter in this context. Maybe I'm not the expert in this space. And that we needed expertise around hyperlocal language and broader context surrounding our analysis of tweets from black youth and the misint misinterpreting a tweet or over-identifying an innocuous language as threatening can have detrimental consequences for this specific population. What happens when you misinterpret a post about grief and call a threat? Whereas one set of interpretations gets you resources and support and mental health service, and the other interpretation gets you criminalized, pathologized, arrested, or harmed. So what do we need? We need ethical annotation processes. We need to bring everyone together. We need to be checking our biases all along the way. And we need to be centering these young people as the voice for how we interpret this work. And so the power of domain expertise is that we got a more robust understanding of context, including hyperlocal language, the backstories that they brought to the table, their understanding of music and identity and masculinity, um, help us understand the context surrounding a post and the triggering events that may shape how you should interpret a post. Meaning, if there was a violent event at a school that may trickle back into the neighborhood, understanding the gangs that might be embedded in that school would then inform how we understand and interpret where violence may happen, who's involved in that violence. But if we don't understand those deeper, broader connections of how institutions are embedded in systems and how people are embedded in community, community and spaces, we will miss the very translational tools that we need to bring in more accurate interpretation. But this is challenging. A lot of people get excited when I talk about youth and domain expertise because it is, it is an important pathway I think to independence and scholarship and helping people to understand their expertise, but it is not an easy thing. What I learned is that I don't work the same as young people, that our use of email is very different. The way we talk about problems is very different. And then life would happen, right? Some of the young people, they would have to become the sole breadwinner in their family, or they may need a bed or need food. And so they wouldn't have time to be focused on this Ivy League research project because life was happening. And so my goals had to be thrown out the window. And we had to figure out clear and organic and authentic ways of collaborating. And one of the things that we did is that we built in a mentoring system with the neighboring community um, organizations like the YMCA. And we hired folks to be mentors that had closer relationships with the young people. And so when life was happening, they would have someone that can do that translational work. And so again, if you want to think about how these, these technological systems can be applied in holistic ways for vulnerable populations and for the most pressing social problems, that it has to start with people. And we have to con consistently be wrestling with people and identity and making meaning of those spaces. So one of the things that we were able to do together, this is a clear collaboration of community partners, young people, domain experts, social workers, social scientists, and computer scientists. So this is an example of a type of post that we would be interpreting and that would be labeled as either aggression or loss and then be handed off to our computer science colleagues. And so one of the things that our community members that those expert translators help, help us to understand that this post is more than you think it is. Jay Smoke, I'm thinking about D-Money, a couple of emojis. There's a lot happening in this post. One of the things that we learned is that Jay Smoking is a concept for making fun of someone that has been murdered. And so folks would name weed after someone that has been killed. And so you get an understanding about the use of substance use, about injury or potential in injury, and grief. 
And so this labeling, this identification of the various interactions that are happening in just a couple of characters becomes important to inform a more rigorous annotation and labeling process. And so this is this close interaction work, that if we're going to do this dance between social scientists and technologists, the close interactions, the blending of ideas, the honoring of expertises, the inclusion of other people is at the center. And so in my lab, we have been learning from our mistakes, our misgivings, our misinterpretations, and really trying to disrupt how we do this work, understanding various partners that also need to be involved, and really thinking about, well, then where does this work go in terms of dissemination as well? So one example, this is kind of a reimagining of how we do this work with engineers, is to work with the city as well. And so we spent the last two years working with the New York City's um, uh, mayor's office to talk to low-income residents all over New York City about well-being, about violence. And we use those qualitative interviews and focus groups with those individuals to then compare it to 12 million posts that our engineering colleagues were able to extract. And we wanted to see, are we seeing similarities and differences in how, there's, in how a global conversation is being constructed on social media? versus what we're hearing through more traditional means. And we learned a lot that there are some similarities, but there's also differences in how people behave and show up in digital spaces or within our research context. And so we're able to sit and study not only the, the ideas around well-being and violence, but also integrating both sets of methodologies to get closer to accuracy and meaning and making sense of, these, of our blended worlds. We're also able to use the same concepts to then work on joy as well. And so the lab is moving from aggression and grief and loss because our algorithmic systems are able to help us find other critical dynamics that we may not have seen. And so one of the dynamics that we have seen is that folks who are grieving will resist grief or will push back against grief by looking for joy. And that a lot of our most fun social media platforms, I spend three hours on TikTok per day, are efforts to resist grief, right? And so what would it mean to then study grief algorithmically? And so we now have a new study uh, that's been sponsored by um, uh, uh, Microsoft to use AI to automatically find joy in social media spaces, bring in those young people to validate how we language joy, to making sure that we're not calling something joy when it's not joy, or vice versa, really trying to check how, we, how language is colonized and making sure that we're not a part of that problem. And then we want to create digital hubs where people can hang out and find joy together and look for joy together. Again, this kind of, this, this work, this idea, this project, this process, would not have happened had we not been involved in these earlier conversations with technologists and computer engineers and so forth and so on. So I think, as I've said before, to get to, get to where we need to go, we need to reimagine expertise in this space, in the digital world, in this developing metaverse. There are lots of folks who are working to train folks who are currently in prison and coming out of prison to code. My, my colleague, Courtney Cogburn, um, has created a virtual reality experience that merges expertise from psychologists and um, engineers and computer vision experts and community members to put you in the body of a young black boy through manhood. And it's geared towards white liberals to help folks understand this journey. Because if you're not in the shoes, it's really hard to grapple with the type of racism and violence that young black boys and men experience in their, life, in their lifetime. Uh, I would definitely recommend that you um, uh, search for A Thousand Cut Journey, and I would definitely recommend that you invite Courtney Cogburn out to give you the VR experience, because it is a life-changing experience. But one of the coolest things uh, that I've seen is that we ha there are people that are reacting to how technological systems are affecting their world, right? We're seeing community members, sex workers, musicians push back against the ways in which algorithmic systems can surveil and impact their life. And so we have an example of um, sex workers who partner with um, uh, uh, musicians to advocate against the use of surveillance tools in their work. And then we can also learn a lot from just the everyday citizen, right? 
Fighting bias doesn't always require fancy algorithmic tools. Solutions, collaborations can exist in the everyday, in the banal, in the mundane. The things that we have around us, merging the familiar and routine practices, wearing makeup, can push back and resist algorithmic discrimination. And so blending in expertise, connecting to what's on the ground, using that to translate and to connect is really important. Again, I think that social work allows us to have a framing for how we can ask questions to begin processes for building ethical technical, technical systems. So what are the action steps? What can we do today to combat bias in the metaverse? We need hyper-inclusive involvement of all community members. We need to be disrupting who gets to be at the table, who is being educated, and how they're being educated. We need to make sure that we have training programs in and outside of universities or bringing in community members to university settings so that we are training folks to be a part of this disruption, this advocacy work, if we're actually going to fight bias, because it's not purely an academic endeavor. We need advocacy. We need policy change. We need science. We need all of these things to counteract the possibilities of bias in the metaverse. And we need those first-line workers, voices representing social workers and counselors and nurses and outreach workers all need to be at the table. You need to be aware and engaging with education, training, and fellowship programs. The work happening at Georgetown Law and the Center for Privacy and Technology, the Digital Justice Lab, my lab, Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University. These are all things that need to be in our orbit because these are multidisciplinary centers that are bringing in all types of folks to focus on all of the potential challenges and biases that might be coming through in this new developing metaverse. But I hope one of the things that you're taking away is that the need for a reflexive approach. It's not reflection, right? It's not just about an awareness, but an awareness that is transformational. So I think having those difficult conversations around social complexities and real world problems, adopting specific nuances and local um, expertise to address potential consequences, and demanding and advocating for diverse and inclusive and less harmful tools, and then using that to then engage in new research projects, to engage in new advocacy projects, to push for change at both the state, local, and um, the city, lo the local, state, and federal levels. I think we need to continue to redefine and reimagine expertise in this space. I think that when we respect and value diverse and lived experiences, we create an opportunity to anticipate needs. I think we need to center all lived experiences, offer, offering a holistic way to move beyond classifying human behavior into these neat data bins and forcing us to reconsider and overall who gets to participate in the design of the metaverse. One way that we can be doing this is teaching racial literacy and technology. This would be a great collaboration between a social science school and engineering. We need to break the patterns of harm in communities of color. So we can be studying things like air airport scanners and credit scores and advertising algorithms and social media and medicine together and identifying the racial tensions in these spaces. We understand this is also built on three foundations, intellectual understanding, how does structural racism operate, Emotional intelligence, this is a skill that can be taught. We can be working on this together. Ability to resolve racially stressful situations in workplaces. How may algorithms and social science help? And a commitment to action. This isn't letter writing. This isn't grandiose things on websites. This is crucial for the reduction of BIPOC in the workplace. This is the actual commitment to work that we work together on. This is a commitment to action. What is your commitment to action today? What is the University of Michigan Dearborn going to do today, knowing that we can anticipate bias in the metaverse? Is it going to be a bottom-up approach or a top-down approach? But I think reducing the harm of racial bias requires a commitment to turn insights into action plans. So what are some things that we can start to do already? Create a series of online videos about the potential issues of racial bias in the metaverse. Developing assessment tools and evaluation tools. Developing a curriculum for computer science classrooms. Conducting research on racial literacy and tech. And piloting experiential learning workshops.
But you're not alone. There's a lot of cool people and a lot of amazing spaces and a lot of amazing books that are out there for your research and education right now, for your students, for your classes, for your research, that can help us to get there. Here's an example of some of the books that have been, have been transformative in my own work. Take a screenshot. I hope that you read all of these books. And that is it. Thank you so much for your time. I will break the ice. First, I want to tell you it was a fabulous presentation. You're doing incredibly important work in an incredibly important area. Thank you. So I, I applaud uh, everything that you've been doing. But you raised so many questions in my mind. I'm just stunned that the room is silent here. So one of the things uh, that is a takeaway from this, and I noticed you mentioned imaginaries. I presume you're talking about Sheila Jasanov's socio-technical imaginaries at Harvard and stuff. As we move towards that area, where are you seeing the re relinquishment of agency in all of this? Because we're, we're moving towards an area where technology is so dominant that people are following GPSs into lakes, right? And they're just listening to what technology says and have relinquished agency. And then, at the same time, we have technology that's being ignored. For instance, climate change, sure. right? And people are, are saying that they're not going to accept the climate change models. And that relates to Jonathan Haidt's work, right, in terms of predispositions uh, controlling a rational thought, right? So I'm just wondering yeah. how you see the role of the individual in a technologically rich environment and what their responsibility is. Because you're taking on the technology side, which is critically important, but it then begs a question, well, that's the wrong use of the word, beg the question, but then it proposes the question of what is the role of the individual in all of this? You know, I, I appreciate the question. And what comes up for me is that I probably want to pan out a bit, because I think that there's probably been an important role for the university that has not come to fruition. And that is a need to produce comprehensive digital literacy. Because I can't, you know, in seventh grade, you learn about what it means to be a citizen in the United States. You learn about politics and the presidency and governments. You kind of, under, you kind of learn how to move through the physical world, beginning as a middle schooler. But if you're not a rich kid, you may not get a literacy in what it means to live in a digital world and to ask these deeper reflexive questions about what does it mean for me, individual person, to be in this world? Should I trust technology? Do I have a techno chauvinist approach where I think that everything technology is great and is supreme and I have an ego around that? What are the questions I need to be asking? When is, what does moderation look like in this space? When is enough enough? And I think we've missed an opportunity to be training folks in schools of education to teach digital literacy, to be training engineering students to be, to be considering um, ethics as a part of their overarching education. I think there's a lot of opportunity to disrupt what you're saying, but I think we have to come to an agreement that the digital is here to stay. It's only going to progress. And what is the role of the university in that process? Are we going to be you know, just tacitly receiving, or are we going to be active and advocating? And I think this is, a, this, is, this is a pivotal moment for us. Thank you so much. It was 
really fascinating talk and a uh, lot of, as uh, Chancellor mentioned, a lot of interesting questions you raised. One of the, like, uh, I would like to know your thoughts on this uh, facial recognition system, understood it's biased and all those, and then a lot of like bad things has happened. But moving forward, what is going on, like as you are working in this space, so what is going on in basically adoption of these systems, because they can help to some extent, but making them fair, I mean, what are like basically what you see moving forward, like cities, like a, a poli city police adapting these technologies for basically protecting citizens, okay? Not harming them, but how like basically technology is moving in that space? Yeah, great question. You know, one of the things I learned as a social work student is the importance of active listening. And one of the things I've also learned as a researcher who works in tech and data science spaces is that there isn't a lot of active listening happening. What I've learned in New York is that folks are irate when they do not get to decide when a facial recognition system is placed in their world. There are low-income residents in New York City that push back against the use of facial recognition systems in their apartment complex. Why? Because the idea is that someone else told you that that was safety, but yet hundreds and thousands of people said, hell no, that is not safety, that is surveillance. That feels like a really critical learning moment. And that perhaps when we want to develop healthy tech or tech that works for everyone else, that perhaps the goal isn't to create the tech first, that maybe we should ha be having deeper conversations. Because I agree, I agree with you, I'm not someone who doesn't like technology. I, mean, I think there's lots of promise. I think, we're not ask I think we can ask better questions. And I think that we can engage in different processes and approaches, but yet the kind of main mantra is to build and break and build and break, but that building and break breaks. And the folks who are at the margins are the ones who are the recipients of that. And so I think that, again, we can change the course. And we also have to have, this is why we also need people in business who are having conversations about ethics and AI to be talking about how we, we translate, you know, justice as a bottom line? What does it mean to be a company of ethics? What does it mean to be a corporation that values these, 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 these deep and complex ideas and thoughts? Um, so we need help in that space. Thank you for a great talk. Um, you covered quite a few things, general ideas. I want to hear your opinion on one particular thing. That's about uh, polarization happening everywhere. And when I go to, I'm not on TikTok, but on YouTube, I start watching videos, it starts sending more videos, and I feel like it's like a huge gravitational force pulling me to my corner, Yep. and uh, I stay there. If I keep just watching those videos, I'm seeing the same things over and over again. So what's your take on recommendation algorithms? Yeah, not as a place that I study, but I do have a PhD student that is um, theorizing algorithmic resistance for this very issue, right, that um, an example is you're a black 20-something, um, you're interested in justice movements, you start to like and support the videos of folks who are promoting those ideas, and then you get locked into the algorithm. And so what we hear qualitatively is that young people feel it's a complex feeling and, and set of emotions because on one end, you want to support these movements and these venues allow you to build those connections and to support, but as someone that wants to pursue joy in healing and well-being, you are now trapped in the algorithm that you did not decide to be in, in full thought. And so I think that there's, again, space where we need to be thinking, like, I think there's a role for qualitative work in being able to identify the points with which algorithms are not working for communities, for individuals, for a host of topics and things. Thank you for, thank you for a great uh, presentation. Um, I wanted to have your thoughts on, on the issue from a curriculum perspective. Um, so um, I'm a computer science faculty. So we tend, um, so looking at it from a computer science faculty or engineering faculty, so we tend to focus more on the technical aspect. Mm -hmm. See the, oh, I don't have time to cover topics related to social sciences in my classes because I need to teach X, Y, Z to my students. And from the other perspective, from a social science faculty perspective, maybe they, they, would, they would think similarly that they don't have time in their curriculum to infuse 
those kind of topics to those students. So what are your thoughts on that? What would be the best way to approach yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, the first thing that I wonder is like, wh what are the values of both schools that informs this idea around time that is clearly creating some tension, right? Um, so I would want to have, I, I used to lead a curriculum committee, so like I would want to have that conversation in the curriculum committee. I taught a design justice course with computer scientists last year um, at Columbia. And I think, to your point, it was challenging. It was challenging because um, both faculty and students had different um, perspectives on how we are, um, think about a problem. Uh, we had different ways of doing it based on our training. But the beauty of building that class out and bringing in engineering and social work students and other social science students is that it forced us to have those conversations. So e like, there was some beauty in the chaos of it all that I wouldn't recommend a tenure track person do per se. But if you have tenure and you have time and opportunity and you have space to think about it, then those types of moments, I think, lead towards innovation that that oftentimes we just aren't able to experience because we're based in our silos. And so I think it, it might feel a little risky, but I think that that is also an element of innovation in education. Thanks so much for your presentation, Dr. Patton. It was excellent. I'm neither a social scientist or a, a, a computer scientist or engineer, but I do work in social epistemology, and um, my work has really been focused on sort of the breakdown in, in intercultural dialogue and social differences. Um, and I'm happy to hear you say you spend three hours a day on TikTok as part of your <laughs> research, because <laughs> I don't spend, maybe, uh, but, uh, but I've been fascinated by TikTok, yeah. and I've shared this with some of my colleagues. Um, and in particular, local um, TikTok around um, cultural identities. Yeah. Um, so there's some wonderful, uh, probably lots of folks here may know, but really funny, wonderful um, parodies of parents uh, in Arab American communities and funny things about Dearborn. But the kind of intercultural creativity in some of the work I think is the logic of it yeah. um, is been fascinating to me and there's so much joy in it. Yeah. Um, sure. And when you were talking about joyful spaces, I've just been thinking about how could we kind of recreate that almost in a way here on campus? How could we draw in so that it doesn't have to be on TikTok because there are some real issues with that space as well. But I think it's going to be just corny if we like try to do it here, right? Like it's not going to. I don't gonna... know. <laughs> I, mean, I, what I, you I, I, I love your question. And what I sit with every day is that technology is just a tool and is a representation, representation of life. And so the things that you're seeing on TikTok, I mean, those are real people in real space in real time doing real things, and you see it on TikTok. So why couldn't we recreate those things in real time, and why can't we bridge the two? I don't think, I don't think as the current society that we're living in now that we can avoid and, and negate the power of technology and where it's going. But I do think that we don't have to just be in one space or the other. And so I am loving how people can use technology, and in particular TikTok, to build community in real life, because we like the same things, we're in the same algorithms, we like the same dances. Well, why couldn't you learn about a cool dance that's happening on TikTok and have people doing it right here? Like, if you want to create joyful moments, there's lots of like expressions of joy that are happening in technological spaces that can be replicated and vice versa. So I think it engenders new forms of communication that we can learn from to figure out what we're missing, what we're all missing, especially in these really difficult times. Thank you so much for an incredible talk. I, I had a question because in one of your slides you were talking about the importance of representation um, for, for the metaverse and for um, the BIPOC section. Um, there's no mention, I'm a person of Asian descent, obviously, and I guess I'm curious to know if that's intentionally um, excluded because there's less bias of people um, in, in sort of algorithms um, for people of Asian descent. I, I know, for instance, like in dermatology, um, you know, subcutaneous manifestation of disease is is very different uh, of people with different skin color. Sure. And so there's a lot of distinction between people of Asian descent 
um, people are, who are of African descent, people of Middle Eastern descent, sure. and so I was just wondering if, if there is less bias um, for, for people of Asian descent in some of these algorithmic processes. Great question, a couple of things. I, I certainly don't have the expertise to decide whether or not there's less bias. Um, however, what you're raising is an important point because we don't have a lot of research in this space, particularly as it relates to the Asian community. And so I think what you're also hopefully advocating for is that we need more research, but we also need scholars of Asian descent to be a part of those processes. And we're not seeing, we're not seeing a lot of that work happen. And so I think that there's an awesome opportunity to do that more collaborative work. Uh, I'm also a scholar that focuses on black and brown young people, and so I, um, that's my focus. Thank you again for your time today, and thank you for all you're doing uh, in advancing and developing this uh, field in social work. My question for you um, really relates more to curriculum and academic programs. One, thing, one of the things I love about U of M Dearborn is our size and our ability to to move and do things a, a little bit more quickly than maybe a uh, uh, university side campus like Ann Arbor. What academic programs or concentrations do you see uh, between the business and social work and engineering and social work or concentration areas? So as we think about what degree programs we want to offer or what we want to offer in specific areas of concentration, what do you see on the horizon within your uh, colleagues or you've seen at other institutions that we can think about offering uh, for students as we prepare them for, uh, for the future? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I would have to say I'm seeing a lot of these cross-curricular activities start as research projects. And so I would say that a part of the investment should be on creating interdisciplinary hubs so that people can share, connect, and collaborate. And then for me, at Columbia in particular, that's where the curricular ideas came from. It wouldn't have occurred to me that we can have a joint class between social work and engineering had I not been doing research with computer scientists and understanding the shared language or the differences in language and what the possibilities could be. And to think about the market, right? So like, is there a market for students who train in social work and engineering? And what would that job be? And so starting off with the research group or the lab, I think allows you to kind of figure out some of those earlier things that can inform curriculum. Um, we are seeing uh, um, joint programs that are coming about. One of the things I was working on at Columbia was to create a joint program between the School of Social Work and the Data Science Institute so that uh, um, you want to have, um, you know, technologists that have social justice um, sensibilities that we can create that population as well. Um, we're seeing a lot of this, these collaborations happening in informatics departments and schools of information studies and communication schools as well. Um, but I would like to see more. Uh, the, the challenge, I think, that I have faced in, this, in navigating this space is like who owns what? Um, and then everyone is not on the same page, right? Um, a lot of my colleagues in social work aren't necessarily ready for this intersection, right? There's a lot of like bringing people along. So it's also about like identifying the champions um, across campus that can help build out the curriculum. So I would suggest, number one, I think by um, infusing labs and research groups with opportunities that they can do and pilot experimental and innovative um, studies, but also create some funds where if, if there's an offshoot of that, then they can create curriculum around the work they do too. So at Columbia, there was a, there's a program called the Collaboratory um, uh, Fellowship, which is a three-year um, fellowship where you get $150,000 and you have to be an interdisciplinary team. And you build out a set of interdisciplinary courses together. You get paid for your time in the summer to develop those courses. Um, but it gives you the focus, the money, the time, and energy to be able to do that work together. So I would say, you know, funding these startup labs, groups, um, could be a great first start. Um, bridging off of like the topic of joint um, classes between like sociology and computer science, um, like this might be an unpopular perspective with faculty, but as a student 
it almost feels like we have our like major requirements and then our other classes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times students push away those other classes. Mm -hmm. Like I've heard people say like, I have my real classes and my DDC mm -hmm. classes. Mm -hmm. And um, like obviously I love the idea of combining these two disciplines, but is there a better way to do it in the actual like internships and careers rather than education? Because I feel like in education, like sometimes um, faculty just try to add a class instead of like really combining stuff. Well, I think you're also describing why a student should be on a curriculum committee to, ad to identify these types of challenges. Um, so hopefully you can connect with other faculty here about that. Um, I think you're absolutely right. So I come from a social work tradition, so we think of internships and field work as a part of education. It's not a separate thing. And so I do think that th those experiences can also live um, within a um, within another discipline as well. And so, for example, when I taught at Michigan, I taught students in Detroit who were interested in community-based work in the city of Detroit. And so they did their field placement and they took classes and was all connected around the city of Detroit. I could easily see there being very similar types of opportunities that are built out around this area as well. Thank you.